Welcome to this ChatGPT and other AI tools crash course. My name is Phil Ebener, and I'm so excited to bring you this quick class to help you get started with these tools. We're going to jump right in. I'm going to teach you how to get started, the basic process, and I will be showing you some advanced techniques for using these tools, but I really want you to just start practicing and playing around with these tools so that you can dive deep in however you want to use them. So first, let's get going with ChatGPT. ChatGPT is sort of the spark of this AI revolution. It's a tool where you can prompt it. That's a term you're going to be hearing a lot, prompting, prompt engineering. This is basically how you request it to do something for you. It's the text, the sentences, the verbiage that you use to submit to the AI tool, and then it's going to give you back a result. So head over to openai.com. This is the company behind ChatGPT, or you might hear the term GPT-4, which is the version that is currently out that we are going to be using. Click on product and go to ChatGPT. You'll need to sign up for an account and then log in. Once you log in, you'll see an interface that looks something like this. Currently, there is a free and a paid version. I'm using the plus paid version, which gives me access to GPT-4. You can see here when I do this drop down menu over on the right hand side of the page that it gives you the details of GPT-4 versus the previous 3.5 version, which is available for free to you to get started right now. In the future, GPT-4 might be the free version. It might be the sort of basic version, and maybe there will be a 4.5 that's for paid members. And you can see that the GPT-4 version has more reasoning, conciseness, etc. Whereas 3.5 is faster, the results aren't going to be as high quality. So as a plus member, I can choose GPT-4, but if you're not a paying member, then you'll just see the standard option, which is 3.5. On the left-hand side, you won't see anything until you start doing prompts, but this is our history of prompts. And you can create separate chats by clicking the plus chat button in the top left to organize your chats. So if you're doing multiple projects, I suggest separating it and starting a new chat every time you want to organize it into one thread. It's very simple to use. On the right hand side, there's a chat send message box in the bottom right. And here is where we just start asking it to do pretty much anything. Some ideas to get you going, you can ask it questions for research. You could ask it to write out any content. And currently ChatGPT is text-based. So you're going to submit text and it, you will receive text back. So you can imagine for businesses, this is super powerful for asking it to write out emails, write out social media posts, write out video scripts. The process is going to be very similar for each. It's just going to take a different prompt. In this video, I'm going to use travel as our example, and it could do things for personal travel. We can do research or we can be a travel company and we can have it do some work for us. So simply we could ask, what are the top five things to do in Los Angeles for a family of five? So as this writes out, you can see some ideas already populating. This is something we previously would have done with Google. And then a website with a top five or top 10 list of things to do would pop up and we would have to sift through that information. But ChatGPT has actually put together this list for us based off, off of all of the information it has. ChatGPT was trained on data on the internet up until 2021. It's currently being connected to the internet. You'll hear that term, which means, and maybe by the time you're watching this video, it will be connected to the internet, which means it's connected to all of the latest websites, the latest reviews, and it's probably going to be taking that information from sites like Yelp or TripAdvisor to spit out information for us. So know that right now that one, not all of the data is completely accurate. ChatGPT does have a tendency to just make up fake information from time to time. 
That being said, I think that's sort of an overblown issue for a lot of things. You can see here that these ideas are really great for just personal research. But if you're trying to do research on trending topics and the latest information, it's not going to be there yet. So this is a great first step, but what's beautiful about ChatGPT is we can take it a step further. We can ask or prompt, create a one week travel itinerary with this information. So this is finishing typing out for us, but you can see that it breaks it down by day. It gives us a morning, afternoon, and evening sort of itinerary, filling in the gaps and also including the information from that previous response. So what you'll learn is that ChatGPT on these threads, it's using what you've previously prompted, the information that it's spit out to you, and it's using that for future prompts. And that's how you can really use it in a more advanced way. You're not just doing one simple prompt from the scratch, which can start, you can do. You could have asked it, ChatGPT, write out a one week itinerary for a family of five with the top five attractions to visit. And it would have done something similar, but I found that starting with a smaller prompt and then expanding on it and reprompting it works a lot better. So this is great if you're just doing personal research, but this can be used for a business. Maybe you are a website creating an article or a guide with this information. Maybe you're a hotel and you want to have brochures that have information like this or printouts that you can give to your guests. You could also take this a step further and ask, turn this itinerary into a five minute video script. And here you can see that it gives us back a timeline of the video. It has shot ideas for the types of video shots you're going to get. It's going to have voiceover ideas. And you can imagine that in the future with tools that are coming down the pipeline with ChatGPT and other AI tools that you could plug this script into a video editing application, it's going to be able to find stock footage that has what's on these shots. Shots of downtown Los Angeles, shots of the Getty Center. It might even have an AI-based voice that will read this for you. Now, you might not want to use all of these AI tools. You might not want to do it all with AI, but it could totally simplify the process of creating content for you like it's doing right here. All right, so here it has just completed that video script. Amazing. What, what do we need to do with this video? We need to promote it, right? Let's have ChatGPT write a social media post to promote this video. Write a social media post to promote this video. And now it's coming back with this social media post that includes emojis, it has hashtags, it has a spot for the link for the video that we'll plug in all done for us. This is sort of mind blowing, right? Well, this is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of what you can do with ChatGPT. I want to show you in the next video how you can engineer the prompts to really fine tune what you're getting, what you're getting back from ChatGPT. So we're going to continue with this process, but we're just going to make it even better. And I'll show you some more advanced tips coming up in that video. So hopefully this first video gets the mind rolling. Go ahead and sign up for ChatGPT if you haven't done so yet. And uh, again, I'm using the ChatGPT4 version. If you're using the 3.5 free version, the results are still going to be good, but they're not going to be as creative and as unique as what you're seeing here. So just keep that in mind. Okay, hope you enjoyed this video and we'll see you in the next lesson. Click over to that one right now. See you there. In this lesson, I want to show you how to do better prompt engineering. Basically how we can change what we type in to get a better response. So far, you've seen that we've asked ChatGPT to create different types of content, different formats of content. We did a video, we did a social media tweet, we asked it just to put out some text. Depending on whatever format you want, you can prompt ChatGPT to do that. The next and more advanced ways to customize our responses is to adjust who the audience is for and 
what the tone is or how we want ChatGPT to respond. What we can do is we can do this from scratch or we can take existing content either from a thread that we've already created or you can copy and paste text from an article or something that you've written out and ask ChatGPT to edit it for you. Let's start from scratch with a different prompt, but I'm going to add a couple details for ChatGPT. So my initial prompt is you are a high school teacher taking a group of students to visit Paris for one week in the summer. Write an email inviting potential students to join them on this trip. Include the price of the trip, which is $2,500. Also include a list of five benefits for participating. Make it exciting and fun. So I've included those last bits which is something you should do when you're prompting if you want anything specifically back from ChatGPT. Don't just expect it to come up with ideas or write things for you if you want something specific. Things like including a list is something you can ask it to do because otherwise it might just come back with a email with paragraphs, but what it should do now is come back with a some sort of list with those five benefits. Also, prompting it as a high school teacher, and then the last with the tone, make it exciting and fun, that's going to change how it's written compared to writing for a group of seniors, adults that are older taking a tour of Paris. It's going to be a lot different than this email, which says, starts out, Dear students, we hope this email finds you well and excited for the approaching summer break. We are thrilled to announce an amazing opportunity to explore the world beyond our classrooms. Picture yourself wandering the cobblestone streets of Paris, basking in the city of lights, and indulging in the rich cultural heritage and world-renowned cuisine. Now make that dream a reality. It's pretty good, right? It has a subject line. Something that I'll just tell you you can do, though, later on is you can ask it, write five catchy headlines or subject lines for this email and then you can pick and choose the one that you want. You don't just have to go with what it writes for you. And of course, you can edit all of this stuff. Here it's writing out the five benefits that you get from taking this trip, cultural immersion, language skills, global perspective, educational enrichment, friendship, and fun. So here it's ending with, to reserve your spot, please reply to this email or stop by room 202. So sometimes ChatGPT is just making up what it thinks you're going to want. And of course, we can edit that. Maybe I'm in room 301, not 202. Or maybe we don't need to have that on there. And it'll just be an email address. But isn't this incredible? It's written out this email for us. But the magic of this is that we can engineer the prompt to get a completely different type of response. So I'm just going to copy and paste this prompt and change a couple of things. All right, so I've written, you are an immersive horror travel company taking a group of young adults to visit Paris for one week in the winter. Write an email inviting potential guests to join this spooky, spooky trip. Include the price, include a list of five non-traditional things they'll be doing on the trip, diving into the quirky, unique, and scary side of Paris. Make it sound scary, but intriguing. Dear adventurers, what if we told you that the Beneath the glitz and glamour of the City of Lights, there exists a spine-chilling, darker side waiting to be discovered. This winter, we invite you to join us on an unforgettable journey, one that will send shivers down your spine and tingle your sense of adventure. Here's a sneak peek into five of the unconventional, spine-tingling activities we have planned. 1. Catacombs After Dark Descend into the chilling labyrinth of catacombs where millions of Parisians were laid to rest centuries ago. Ghost and Legends Night Tour. Roam the ancient cobblestone streets, streets of Paris after sunset, discovering chilling tales of the city's infamous ghosts, haunted spots, and unsolved mysteries. Père Lachaise Cemetery Nocturnal Visit. Is your mind blown yet? Because this is crazy to me how it can come up with this email. And that's just based off of how we prompted it. So you're going to hear this term prompt engineering and it sounds confusing. It sounds advanced, 
but basically all it is is changing the way you write your prompt, including more details, including the format you want it to write back at, including the tone and information that you want it to include. Also, giving a role. If you asked it to write a simple email as a teacher, as a business professional, as a kid, as a YouTube influencer, the response is going to come back completely different. And I just encourage you to play around with it because that's what it's what you're going to learn best. So this is a pretty ridiculous, awesome example. Something else to note is that you can ask ChatGPT to help you out. So if you're ever stuck, use it as a learning tool yourself. So I can ask, what are 10 roles that you can play as ChatGPT? And here it's giving us lots of different roles that ChatGPT can play. Educator, advisor, language tutor, creative assistant, research assistant. Use it to help you improve your prompts. All right, thank you so much for watching this lesson. I hope by now you have a good sense of what ChatGPT can do for you. If you have questions or you're confused about anything, let me know, I'm happy to help. But right now the best thing to do is just play around with it. Think about what in your own life, personally and professionally, can you use ChatGPT to help with? Because we are moving into a world where Jobs are going to be taken over by AI. That's a fact. It's already happening. And so knowing how to use these tools to improve your own life, to improve the way you do your job is going to be super important moving forward. And hopefully this couple videos have helped you get a little bit closer to knowing how to do that. All right. See you in another video. Have a great day. Welcome to this new lesson. In this one, we're going to be looking at mid-journey. So you're going to learn how to create your own images, photorealistic images, illustrations, and so much more with this powerful tool. Go to midjourney.com and if you click on showcase, you can see examples of what you'll be able to do with this app from illustrations and digital art to realistic images, you can do it all. In the past, Midjourney has had a free trial, but currently you do have to pay to get started. To sign up, you wanna click the sign in button and then join the beta. Midjourney is built on the Discord application, which is a website and a downloadable computer app. It's sort of like a community chat app, similar to Slack, where you can have different channels or groups or areas where you can chat and you'll see how it works in a second but all you have to know is that you have to sign up for a discord account which you can do by following the process when you click on join the beta so if you already have a discord account you'll want to click already have an account and sign in if not you'll have to sign up for one here once you sign in you can see your different discord groups or sites that you're on. You can see that I'm in a couple. The mid journey one is here and here you can see all of the different channels. There's one for getting started, which is great to check into to see some instructions for getting started and it will walk you through the process that I'm going to show you right now. To actually create an image, it's a little bit confusing, but basically what you need to do is go to any of these newbies channels. Don't worry about it, just go to the newbies channel and you'll see a stream of comments and images that other people are actually creating in real time. To create an image, you have to follow this specific process. Go to the chat box or the messages in the bottom of any of these newbies channels, type in slash imagine and you'll see the different commands start to prompt up here or pop up up here and so you can type in imagine or just click that imagine and then you simply type in anything that you can imagine an illustrated cute cat in a top hat and similar to what we saw with chat gpt 
you can go super in depth into what the prompt is and that's part of the magic of making the result exactly what you're imagining but you can start with something simple and you can see though other chats sort of started to pop in and what's happening is other people are doing this at the same time this is a public feed so other people can see what you're creating but you see what i've done here it's starting to populate or render it's at 31 percent 46 and you can start to see the image once it's done that chat or that comment will pop down to the bottom as an actual published comment and here we can click on it and we can see the full resolution of that image so we've got four illustrated cats what do we do with this it gives us four variations underneath this image you see eight buttons or actually nine buttons u1 through 4 and v1 through 4 U means you're going to be able to upscale or create a higher resolution image of any of one of these. Starting in the top right, it's U1, U2, 3, and then 4. So if you're happy with one of these images, you just click U1, for example, and it will upscale this first image. V1 through 4 means you like this image, but you want it to create some variations to see if it can create something a little bit different. So I say I like this fourth one, but I want to see what it comes up with it, with some variation. So I'm going to click V4 and then I can scroll down and I can see that it finished this one job of the first U1 upscaling. And then down below it has my next variation job that's starting to run. There was that one other button if I scroll up here. It's this rotating arrows button, and that's just to create four brand new re variations. So completely start from scratch, do four new ones. And so now we have these four new variations. And from here, we can upscale one, create more variations, regenerate everything, and you can keep going and going and going. So I think that first one's pretty darn cute with its little paws coming out. So I'm going to upscale that one. Once it's upscaled, you can either download it by just simply clicking on it, right clicking and choosing to save to your computer, or you can click web right here. And from here, you could also see a, you have a make variations button too. If I click on the web button, what's going to happen is it's going to open up the mid journey site where you can sign in with your account that you created already, your discord account. And here we have our mid journey library. And it's loading all of the images that I've created in the past and saved to my account. And here it opens up. And from here, we can save it. We can favorite certain ones that we like. We can share it with people. It gives us the information. And it also gives us some related images that you might be interested in looking at. And then back on our profile, if you exit out of that image, you can see all of the ones that we have saved to the web. So this is a great, clean way, easy way to save photos for using later. There's also a di another way to create images, which I find a little bit more organized and easier to work with. If you click on the direct messages button up here and then you click and then you click find or start a conversation, you can type in mid journey and find the mid journey bot. And here you can see that I have an organized thread with all of my own creations. So this is not competing with a bunch of other mid journey users. It's all right here. So again, we type in slash imagine backslash that is now let's do a photorealistic image of a cat wearing a top hat sitting in the middle of a pile of fall leaves the background is blurry it is a photo shot at sunset with beautiful golden hour light. This is where you can get super detailed with exactly what you want your image to look like. So the main things while this starts to load to think about when you're putting in a prompt for mid journey are of course the subject, also what's around your subject, what the setting is, 
and then the style or format. So is it a photo? Is it an illustration? Is it a sketch? Is it digital art? Is it in a particular style? You can reference other photographers or periods of arts. You can be impressionistic or abstract, modern pop art, anime or manga style. You could reference popular historical photographers and you can reference ca camera models, camera lenses to use. And here we have this, this is pretty good. And there's obviously something about these images that look fake because it's sort of a magical idea. But in terms of the quality of the image, the cats themselves look themselves look pretty darn realistic. I'm going to do some variations for this vi variation four. the light is beautiful. It captured exactly what I was going for. And if I didn't have the top hat in there, it would look almost like a real photo captured at a perfect time with perfect lighting edited really well. And you can only imagine what in the next year, two or beyond these tools are going to be able to do. And you'll also notice that depending on how many people are using the system, sometimes it takes longer or shorter for your images to actually pop up and uh, be created. So these are all pretty darn good. I kind of actually like this original one right here. So I'm going to upscale that fourth option and I'm going to save that to my MidJourney account. Something to note about the direct messaging option though is that your images can still appear on the public mid-journey site. They pull images that are great, that are then rated well, and they might showcase it. So depending on what you're creating, it's not a private, private option. You have to pay for, I think, the top tier account on mid-journey to do what's called stealth mode, which is private, uh, having all of your images private. So just be aware of that. Awesome. So that is a quick crash course into mid journey. In the next video, we're going to learn how to use our own images to create cool, fun variations of those images and also how to use uh, an image that mid journey created to create a second image or a third image in a series. In this lesson, I want to just quickly show you some more advanced things that you can do in mid journey talking a little bit more about prompt engineering specifically for mid-journey. You can see an image of a little character that I'll be showing you how to do in just a second. But the first thing is you can actually take a photo of yourself or really any photo and have mid-journey transform it into something else. This does not always work. When you put your own image, it doesn't look exactly like you yet transformed into another person. There's other AI tools that can do that that I've seen like Len, I believe it's Lenza AI. But with mid journey, if you want to try it out, you have to do this either on the mid journey bot where you can upload a photo or you need to find a link to a photo of yourself that's online. So you can upload a photo to a public facing website like Imager or even if you have like, for example, if I type in my name on Google, it will show up all of the different images that are public and you, you need a decently high quality image. And on YouTube, this profile image is one that I can right click. I'm going to copy the link address and then I'm going to go back to my Discord server, either the mid journey bot or to one of the newcomer rooms we're going to type in imagine and then here's the specifics. You need the greater than less than brackets open. We paste the link to that public URL, close it out, chomp, chomp, chomp. And then we say what we want. This man as a Viking photo, realistic image with high qual quality details. And we'll just leave it at that for now. And I got the wrong link. It's not the link to this page, it's the link to the image, copy image address. Whoops. So let's try that again. Imagine. While this does that, the other way you can do that is by uploading to the bot 
or the messaging bot. So you click the plus button, we can click to upload a file. Here we can find an image. It has to be a relatively clean image and then you send it by pressing return and that will upload it. And then what you can do is type in imagine, open chomp chomp bracket, uh, greater than or less than rather. And then what we do is simply drag and drop this image into the chat, which brings in the URL, close that bracket, and then we type in our prompt. This man wearing a pirate costume. All right, so here we can see the original null one pop up. And you can tell that, oh, there's some similarity. So this image compared to the other one, it's not too off, but it definitely looks like more of like maybe a second cousin of mine, not necessarily me as a Viking, but still pretty cool. And then, of course, you could add all your details. You could have it, you talk about the background. You could say a full body shot wearing a certain type of costume, fighting off dragons or whatever you want to say. And then here we're going to get the next one and you're going to see the difference in the what it perceives as the person that it creates. So this one's loading. And again, you can see that it's not me. It's not me wearing a pirate costume, but it's it's something close. And what I found is that you can regenerate it all if you just refresh everything from scratch. Like some of these are just off totally, but I could see some similarities in some, but you can just regenerate it all. And I found that depending on the prompt, it gets better and better. Like one of the ones I think I did cyberpunk um, and it came out pretty close to me versus some of these other ones. So that is one way that you can just have fun with Midjourney. And I wanted to mention that Midjourney has a lot of documentation for helping you create better prompts. If you go to your Midjourney account and you go to help and FAQ, it has a lot of documentation that will help you. Click on the user guide and here there's a ton of things that you can look into like parameters. So these are things that you can add to the end of your prompt to change different things like aspect ratio. And the, it's highlighted in what you would add. So dash dash AR 16 by nine is aspect changing the aspect ratio to 16 by nine. And you can see some examples of different aspect ratios here. Just go through these on your own time. I don't want to waste your time talking through each of these. Quality, quality is going to increase the detail uh, and quality of the image. It takes longer, but you can increase the quality. Stylize is another one that's kind of cool. Dash, dash, stylize, and then you put in a value, 100, 2,500 different ones, up to 1,000, and you can increase the style. And you have like style low, medium, high, and you can see opening up these images, the difference from a lower quality to a higher style or lower style to higher style. See how the higher style is like much more detailed, much more detailed. And then beneath this, we have some advanced prompts as well, where you can actually like combine images. So this talks about how you can upload an image, which I just showed you some examples, but you can actually upload multiple images and combine them. One last thing up under the getting started, under next steps, under prompts. This is a great description of the different things that you could add to a prompt. So down below, there's this list right here talking about subject, medium, environment, lighting, color, mood, composition, and it gives some examples. These are all things you can play around with to come up with great unique images with Midjourney. All right, I hope you enjoyed this lesson. In the next one, I'm going to show you how to create a consistent character design from one image to the next. One of the current issues with Midjourney, if you're trying to design graphics or images that multiple graphics and images that you'll be using in a series for a website, for an illustrated book or something like that, is that if you repeat the same prompt, it will come up as a different image. Or if you just slightly change the prompt, it will bring up something completely different. So how can we make sure that the images that we are creating can be consistent? Here's a couple ways you can do that. 
First, let's start by creating a character. So what I'm going to do is imagine an illustration of a young boy about to go on an adventure. He is wearing a backpack. Show the full body character design. And we'll just leave it at that. Cool, so now we have these illustrations. These look pretty good. And I'm just gonna go for one right now. You could adjust it, you could create variations, but what I'm going to do is upscale this one image right here. So this one looks pretty good. So our next step would be to type in imagine, and then I'm going to put the open bracket, close bracket with this image inside. So you could just simply drag and drop it there with the brackets. And then we're going to say this boy walking away down the sidewalk about to leave on an adventure. He looks excited. Now while that one loads, that was sort of the basic way to do it and it's not going to be perfect. It's not going to be that great. Sometimes the images, they look a little bit different. They don't look exactly like this drawing might be in a different style. So how can we prompt Midjourney to maintain that style? There's something called the seed. It's sort of like the reference code to a specific image and style that each image created has. And to get it right now, it's kind of a confusing process, but what you have to do is you have to react to this image. And the way you do that is by right clicking add reaction. You're not going to see envelope right here yet. You have to click view more and then do envelope and do the single envelope reaction. And what happens when you do that is that you get a, you actually get a message that shows, and you can see it here, that shows the seed number, okay? So keep that in mind because now we see the results of that original image and you can tell that like this character here doesn't look like the one. They're close, but they're not perfect. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to repeat that process with the seed. So imagine we're going to still take our original image drop it in here and we're going to do the exact same prompt but we're also going to add dash dash seed and then the number the seed number right here okay simply put that in and it should do a better job at matching the style and the character and the person because it knows we're referencing that exact one rather than what it's doing before is it's imagining a brand new image. It's trying to analyze this image that it created and then put it into the new scene that we prompted it. This one, it's actually referencing the backend data that it used to create that original image that we liked. And while this loads, I will say there is one that doesn't look exactly like it. And that is partly my mistake, but I found that it will do this. Sometimes there's one or two that doesn't look exactly like it. But, however, the other three look much, much, much more similar to this one right here. So this character right here, the top left, bottom right, so one, two, and four look much more similar. What I should have added was an illustration because that would have been a little bit more of a specific prompt. So including the style that you want it to return because if I would have put photorealistic image or any other style of artwork, it would have come back as something different, but maintaining the style that you prompted originally for your original character is super important to include in your follow-up prompts as well. And now we have a much better representation of this by adding that illustration. The style is very similar. A couple of these didn't follow the prompt of walking away down the sidewalk. You could add that walking away from camera. You could add all your detail, change the things like the aspect ratio or whatever else that you want. But here we have a much more consistent character than before. 
play around with it. It's not perfect yet. I'm sure that as mid journey improves, there's going to be techniques to improve the consistency of images. Have fun with this. I hope you enjoyed this lesson. Have fun with mid journey. If you have questions, let me know. Otherwise, we'll see you in another lesson. Bye. In this crash course, you're going to learn how to use Google Bard. Google Bard is very similar to ChatGPT. So if you have watched that section, this is going to be somewhat repetitive. It's just the format of the tool is a little bit different. And also a couple of the functions that I'll mention in the following minutes, basically. But you can just go to bard.google.com and sign in with your Google account. Up until now, it has been sort of a beta waitlist thing, but I believe now anyone can access it um, if they have a Google account, but that might not be true for every single country. Once you log in, you will see something that looks like this. On the right hand side, you have your prompt box. You also have a microphone if you want to use that to just do it via verse. Uh, voice, you have a dark theme, which is pretty cool too, That's a little bit easier on the eyes. So I'm going to switch to that for, for now. You have your past BARD activity over on the left hand side, support, etc. It still notes that there might be some mistakes or things in unfactual results. So you have to be aware of that. Currently, it's just text responses similar to ChatGPT, but they are adding an option for an image creator and also a tool where you could submit images as part of your prompts. So let's just do a basic one. Make a list of 10 toddler craft ideas. This is great for me personally to help me take care of my kids or if I was blogging, writing an article, creating a video about craft ideas and it pops up here with our option. A couple of differences that you will notice with Google Bard is that it has a draft option or version option. So here at the top, there's multiple drafts. So there's actually three that pop up for every prompt and you can also regenerate right from here. So it keeps it a little bit cleaner. If you're using the 3.5 version of ChatGPT, you won't have all of the formatting that Google Bard results in. in. GPT-4 is pretty good with bullet points and lists and numbering and things like that. But Google Bard already for the free version has, it comes back with nice formatting, bullet points, outlines and things like that. So this is pretty cool. It comes out with great ideas. Down below too, you can either say it's a good response, bad response. You can also export it, which is very cool. In chat GPT, you just have to currently just copy and paste the text. But here we can export to an email or to Google Docs, which is super cool. The other thing you can do is click Google it and it will open up a search for this idea. And here you can just find directly from Google Bard their search results and go kind of compare notes if you want or if you want to just kind of use it uh, in conjunction with your regular search. Similar to ChatGPT, we can then prompt it for our next text that we want. Write a five minute video on the first craft. And so because it's AI, it's smart enough to know like we don't have to spe specify paper plate donuts. It will know what we mean by that first craft. So here it ha comes back sort of with more of an outlined version of the video. So as the introduction, the materials needed, the instructions, some ideas for variations and a conclusion. It also gives some tips for what you might want to include in this video, which is kind of cool too. We could also prompt it from the beginning with this idea. So we could say, write a five minute script for a video teaching kids how to make paper plate donuts make it fun and exciting. The audience is parents of young kids as well as kids ages three to seven. So when you're writing your prompts, you remember you're not just asking for the content you want, but you're asking for the style that you want it to come back in. You're telling it the audience that it's 
writing for. And this is what we call prompt engineering, changing the prompt to get exactly what you want from it. So Google Bard doesn't do as good as what ChatGPT4 comes back as. It's very similar to that earlier prompt, but what it does, it gives us some additional exact ideas for lines that you might want to say throughout your video. Can you make a donut with sprinkles? Can you make a donut that looks like a cat? So that's kind of fun. It lets us do a little bit more of the work than just doing it all for us, but it's very, very thorough as well. So this is a great tool for sort of making your job easier, but not doing it all for you. We could take this paper plate donut and change up the prompt. Write a 500 word article about this craft. And then we could paste that. And here it has written that out in more of an article format with instructions, tips, ideas for making the paper plate donut even more fun and a it kind of concludes it and always make sure to check out the variations you can kind of combine the different variations to get exactly what you were looking for or there might be one that's in a different format um, that is more of what you were imagining so that's how you use google bard currently i find chat gpt to be a bit more advanced but we know that google Bard has the Google name and company behind it, and it's only going to get better and better and better. So I wouldn't write it off yet, but at the time of recording, I would do most of my work with ChatGPT 3.5 or 4 if you are a Paying Plus member. I just find it to be a bit better. But hopefully in this crash course, it helps you understand some of the capabilities of Google Bard. Uh, the other thing that Google Bard has that ChatGPT doesn't have yet is it's connected to the internet. So what I could do, sorry for keeping you for just a second, but I wanted to mention, you can type in things like, what are the top five restaurants in Claremont, California, where I live? And it will give it real-time results based off of current data. So it knows, it looks at different review sites and probably Google reviews as well. And it will come back with these results. And ChatGPT, since it's not currently connected to the internet, does not do that. However, as I've mentioned, they are doing that currently. They're planning to connect ChatGPT to the internet. And so current reviews and internet information will be used in its responses very, very soon. But that is one win, I guess, for Google Bard at this current moment. All right, I hope you enjoyed this crash course and we will see you in another lesson. Bye. Welcome to this crash course on Dolly. Dolly is an image generation tool similar to Midjourney and it's put out by OpenAI and it's a very simple tool to use. So the pros of Dolly are that it's very simple to use. You actually get free credits every month as of now to test it out and play around. The cons are that the quality of what you get back in terms of your images, the details, just the professional quality is not as good as what you can get in a tool like Midjourney. But let's try it out and I'll walk through. It's very simple. Go over to OpenAI's website, go up to product and then Dolly tool and then choose try Dolly. If you already have a, an account, then all you need to do is sign in. In the top right corner, you'll see that you have a certain number of credits. Right now I have 79 left and that's because I've purchased some, but you do have some credits to start out. At the top of the page, you have a search bar where you put in a prompt. You have an option to upload an image to edit. And then you also have some samples, which are great to look, out, look at to see sort of the examples of the prompts that were used. These images, they pick some of the top ones that have come back from the tool, and that makes sense. But I found that it's just not as good easy to get a great quality image, especially more of like the photorealistic images with Dolly. However, let's go ahead and try. So I'm gonna show you a basic prompt, then we'll talk through some more advanced props. So a basic prompt would be a fox in a forest. It's going to load 
through on the right hand side you you can see the history of images that you've generated and you can see that I've tested out a few different ones over there and so here we have some basic Fox images that look okay especially when they're smaller when you open them up like this and you can open them up and then click through you start to see that they don't look as high quality as what we saw on mid journey in that section of class if you've watched that, that. so what we need to do is add some more detail to the prompt and again, watch the mid journey lessons because you can use the same prompt ideas here. So what I'll add now is a photo of a fox in a forest, professional wildlife photography. I'm going to even put the focal length of the lens being used. So I'm going to put in 300 millimeter lens, which is like a big telephoto lens where you can zoom in far into wildlife. I'll put beautiful lighting, sunset, back lighting, and photorealistic. Now let's generate it and we'll see what the results are. Once you get your four results, you can make variations of those images. So here we have photos that look a little bit more artistic, right? So here from this view, look better. Beautiful sunset, that backlighting hitting the fur in this one, but the eyes, the face of the fox, it just doesn't look great. And that's where Dolly fails as of now. I'm sure in the future, the tool is going to get better. But here, what we can do is create variation. So what we can do is just click on an image that we like and then choose to create variations. And then it will create four images based off of that photo. One cool thing about Dali, different than Mid Journey, is it has a bit of a photo editing aspect or image editing aspect to, to it. So here we see just doesn't look amazing, right? So let's try a different prompt to see what we can come up with that might look better. And I think some of the more illustrations, the 3D renders, that kind of stuff looks better with Dolly. So what I will do is a cute 3D render of a penguin in the South Pole. <laughs> we'll just do that. Okay, so we've got a few options that might work. Let's go ahead and click on this one. The eyes don't look good. Let's click on variations to see if we can fix that. Get a new variation. You can see tips down below that pop up. All right, so maybe our penguin's just gonna be closing their eyes. And that's fine. We can start from here and I'll show you how to edit a photo. So of course you can download by clicking the download button or we can click edit. One of the things that we have is called out painting or adding a generation frame down here. So we can click this plus frame and now we can add to this photo. So say we want to add more context to the left of this image, we can click there and then choose generate. And we could even type in what, what we want. A polar bear, I don't know, in the South Pole, swimming near an iceberg. 3D rendering of generate. You also have tools here to add an image. So if you have graphics or images you want to add to your generation or to your image, and then also an erase tool where you can erase something. So here we have now a polar bear and it has variation so we can click through. So this one followed it with the in swimming. This one's kind of cool though. I kind of like that one. So I'm going to accept that one. We can erase things. So say we don't like this cloud or something. We can click the eraser and we can erase that cloud. And now we would have to add a generation frame, put it behind, or we can extend it here. And we'll say of three baby penguins playing with a fish. And it should fill in that erase spot and then continue the generation. You don't have to generate more. You could just generate what's behind that erase spot and it should do it. All right, so here's our variations. <laughs> so we're not gonna be competing with uh, DreamWorks or Pixar yet, but okay, not, not terrible. <laughs> okay, kind of funny. Okay, so let's just accept that. From here, we can download the image if we want to our desktop. 
All right, so let's go back. So here we have all of our variations. You can see this was a different prompt, 3D render of a cute penguin, solid light blue background. And then I added the details of different applications that create 3D renders to add some of that detail. A couple others that I actually liked. So here is a Yosemite Valley in the style of vector artwork. So this one came out pretty cool, I thought. Here was a high quality photo of a camera. Again, it's not what you would get back with the same exact prompt with Mid Journey. Still, it's a good tool to know how to use. You can see that some of these other images look pretty good. So let's go ahead and do try to copy this. A Van Gogh style painting of an American football player. A Van Gogh style painting, a woman playing guitar. And so here we have these more abstract images actually look a lot better. I'm gonna create a variation for that. So right now, here's an example that pops up with the tip, stained glass window depicting hamburger and french fries, that's great. So always think about not only the subject matter, but also the style, and if there's any reference to other people's style of painting, photography, the specific format, 3D rendering, a painting, a photo, uh, a sketch, pencil sketch, watercolor, the medium of the artwork. Always think about all those things when you're creating a prompt and definitely check out the mid journey section if you haven't watched that already. So this is Dolly. I hope you enjoyed this lesson. Once Dolly starts to get a little bit more advanced, I'll create some more lessons on it in terms of how to properly improve your prompts and things like that to really get high quality images from Dolly. All right, have a beautiful day. See you in another video. Welcome to this course on Adobe Firefly, their AI tool that is going to revolutionize all of their apps and specifically the website firefly.adobe.com where you can do things very similar and even more advanced than other tools like Mid Journey or Dolly. Here I am on the Adobe Firefly website. It's still in beta and things change rapidly as I've learned using all of these AI tools. Currently they have the options to turn text to image, generative fill, text effects, and generative recolor. So in the next lessons, I will show you how to use each of these tools. Thank you so much for being here. If there's anything I can do to make this class better, if there's something that I'm missing, please let me know. When Udemy prompts you to leave a review, please go ahead and do so. Whatever the review is, it helps me know what you like, don't like about the course, and it helps other students know if it's the right course for them. With that, let's head into text to image generation. So here on the text to image page, you can see examples and you can scroll up or down, which is kind of interesting to see what the image is and what the result is. A hamster wearing a track suit and lifting weights. You click on the box down below to type in your prompt. A cute sea otter holding a bouquet of flowers. You click generate or hit the return button. Here you're automatically going to see something different than what you saw using Dali or Mid Journey if you've used those other tools. You have a lot, of, a lot of different options that can adjust this photo on the right hand side. Now we see the four variations that have been generated. You can click on one of them to open it up to see it in a bigger view. And for each of these photos, you have the option to download it. That might be the first thing you want to do. You can rate it, which will help Firefly get better and better at generating. You also have an option for showing similar. So clicking on this, it will create another version similar to the one that you liked. And there's also an option for generative fill. Before I go over that though, on the right hand side, we have all of these options. So on the top, you can quickly change the aspect ratio from a square image. Say we want a widescreen 16 by nine image for a video thumbnail or something like that. You can quickly adjust it right here in the app. While that loads, we have different content types. So you have none, which will just refer to whatever content prompt you put into your prompt. For example, artwork, illustration, sketch, photo, whatever. If you have that in your prompt, 
you don't necessarily need to choose a content type here. But up here, we can quickly change from art to photo and it will regenerate this same image as a more photorealistic image. Depending on the subject matter, depending on the prompt, it will look more real, more or less realistic. I love, this one is so great right here. I'm going to heart that one. That's going to add that to my favorites. And I'm also going to give it a rating. Down below content type, you have styles. So let's click on the all and you can see there's so many different styles that can change what this looks like. So for example, let's change to hyper realistic. It adds that tag here to our prompt down below. And then also let's go down and change our some of these other settings. So color and tone, we can choose. Do we want it to be black and white, warm tone, cool tone? I'm going to choose vibrant color for lighting. Let's do backlighting. That's going to be nice. And composition, let's go ahead and do a close up. So now we have all of these tags that help us adjust our image and we're going to click generate. Now we have all four image with the styles that we applied, the different settings. This one now beautiful backlighting on this hyper realistic image of this otter. Now this image doesn't look completely like a real photo. I'm going to go ahead and download it. So I'm going to click continue to download it. But a different prompt might work better. Let's leave all of these styles and I'm just going to type in a long exposure of a waterfall and let's actually change our aspect ratio to vertical and now we have an image that looks quite realistic you can see in the detail of this long exposure that the background looks pretty good I might change some of these things like vibrant color I would maybe just put none lighting let's just do none as well composition let's do wide angle let's re generate these options and now this image which is the one that we were looking at before a little bit more realistic because those colors weren't so vibrant and just not natural and that's text to image play around with it use these other examples to give you some inspiration and as I expand this course I will give you lots more tips and advice for creating in incredible images like the ones you see here. See you in the next lesson. Next, let's go over the generative fill option. This is an option you can actually use within Adobe Photoshop, and I'll have a lesson on how you use that later. But right here on the platform, you can also use it. So up at the top, you can click upload an image and then find an image that you want to play around with. So here's an image that I shot of these little water droplets. So the first thing to do is sort of make the selection where you want to add something. So say I want to add a little ladybug. I'm going to take my brush, which my mouse is already my brush, and it's the plus brush, which we have here. So I'm going to make a little spot for the ladybug. If I went too far, I can take subtract and I can get rid or brush back in the photo. So I'm going to take this here. You also have your brush settings as well. And you could also quickly use these selections to select the background or to invert the selection, which would basically select everything outside of what you brushed in. Then at the bottom, I'm going to describe what I want. A macro photo of a ladybug. We're going to click generate and now we have these variations of this ladybug that are now added to this crazy macro photo that I shot. If you're not happy, you can click more and it will create more variations or we can click keep and it will add it to my photo. Here's a long exposure I shot in Big Sur. So let's go ahead and add a UFO up here. Simply click UFO, click generate. And now we have this UFO that has been created, blended into our existing image. Pretty crazy, right? Here's another photo I shot in my front yard of this hummingbird. Let's just remove that hummingbird. So I'm going to take that, our remove brush, I'm going to paint over our hummingbird. 
click remove. And now we have a few variations, but because the background is out of focus, it does an incredible job at just removing objects. And you can remove people, things, cars from a scene, you name it, brush over it, and you can remove it. Crazy, right? So this is the generative fill option on the Firefly platform. Check out that Photoshop lesson as well, because I show you how I'm actually using it for virtual staging to add furniture to real estate photos, which you used to have to pay for a service to do that. And now you can do it using Adobe Firefly. All right. Thanks so much for watching and we'll see you in another lesson. In this lesson, let's go over text effects. This is super cool, super interesting. So here you can see some examples. So we've got the gingerbread decoration P we've got the flower lay T we've got the pizza L all you have to do is type in the text you want it to use. So I'm going to type my name in and then describe the text effects ocean waves. It's going to take a minute to generate on the right. You can see sample prompts. If you just want to play around with different types of prompts like flowers, driftwood, bread, toast, etc. Here you can see that it's popped up with four variations of this. I can click through them and it will bring up the variation and you can kind of see a preview of it down below. On the right, you also have some text options so you could change the effects so that the effect is loose on the text, medium or tight constricted to the text, the medium and loose. It will kind of like spill over the edge. If you like that look, you could change the font. So let's go ahead and let's do Cooper. That's kind of like a cool retro style font that might look cool with these waves a little bit round edges. That's very cool. And then you have color. So right now the default is no background. You can click on any of these colors to see what it looks like with a different background. And then there's also a text color that will change the text color depending on what your prompt is. And then you can favor it. You can download it. And now I have this incredible graphic of my name currently. This is not available for commercial use and it is watermarked as such, but it's a great place to play around and use for non-commercial work. So that's pretty much it. Play around with it. I would love to see what you come up with the text effects, post it to the course, tag me on social, wherever you can. I can't wait to see it. Thanks so much. And we'll see you in the next lesson. Now let's look at the generative recolor option. This is perfect for logos and other SVG graphic files. You will need an SVG file. You could click on one of the sample files here to work with, or you can upload a file. I'm going to upload a file that I have here. And then you describe your color palette, night blue, gray, purple. So now you see, an example of what this has turned into. So I can select one that I like. I can then shuffle the colors by simply clicking the shuffle color button and it will transform it into a completely different graphic. Now let's play with this harmony setting. So this will take the colors that we've submitted here and then it will adjust it. So if we want the blue, gray, purple settings plus complementary colors, we can do that. So green is the complementary color to purple. And that's why now that appears. And it has all of these different options for different ways to combine colors, which some of these will create a more jarring image. Some will create a more natural pleasing image. And that's a great thing to play around with for your graphic design. We can add colors here by selecting these colors and it will include those colors into our design. And then as we saw above, we can just select one of these for this image, kind of like this yellow submarine look. And let's get rid of all of these other additional colors. And we're going to refresh. And now we have a few options with the yellow submarine style, dark blue midnight. That's pretty cool. Let's select this one. I'm going to just shuffle these colors a little bit. I like that. So I'm going to give it a rating. I'm going to download it. So this is the generative recolor tool. It's a way to quickly change the colors of your SVG graphics.
Now that you understand how these tools work, how to get started, let's talk a little bit more about how you can implement them into your existing workflow. This is gonna be different if you are just using AI for personal use, if you work for a company and you're trying to use AI tools yourself to assist you with your job, or if you run your own business. If you're a creative, if you're a YouTuber, content creator, artist, graphic designer, you're going to see a lot of ways you can implement AI into your workflow in this lesson. There's three basic options for using AI. The first is during the research phase. So this could be everything from idea generation, coming up with ideas for your content, using ChatGPT just to brainstorm topics for videos, brainstorm article ideas. You can actually do research on the subject matter so not having the tool do the work for you in terms of writing the content, but you could research a subject and then do it yourself. Similar to what you would probably be doing before or be now by doing a quick Google search for a subject that you're not an expert in. You can also use it to generate keywords, keywords that you can implement throughout your content publication. So this is more geared towards, towards people who are putting out content Article, written content, content, audio, visual, whatever type of content, you might be using keywords throughout that written content in your titles, in your tags and keywords for your content. So you can actually use ChatGPT to basically ask it to give you keywords related to your topic. Consumer analysis, what does your target audience like? What are they interested? in what is currently trending. And as ChatGPT connects to the internet, you'll get even better data on this. Google Bard currently is, so you can do that easily with Google Bard. And then competitor analysis. See what other people are doing easily with ChatGPT. So something that I've been doing as a YouTuber is checking out using Google Bard, coming up with list of competitors, coming up with ideas for videos that they've done that are trending, that do really well, and then trying to figure out where, how I find my place as a YouTuber using that data. The next phase is content creation, and this is what a lot of you might be interested in doing. Things from writing articles or documents, writing emails, scripts, social media posts, books, a lot of that boring stuff, if you run a business documentation, uh, co contract drafts, all of that can be done initially with a tool like ChatGPT. And of course, you're going to have to edit them. You know your audience, your brand, your business, yourself. And most of us aren't going to want to just use exactly what's spit out from ChatGPT or any of the other tools, but it can do a lot of the busy work for us. And then there's the tools like Midjourney or Dolly or any other image generation tool that can create social media images, images for YouTube thumbnails, creating graphics for ads, any sort of design or images for print sale. I've been seeing a lot of people using these tools to create patterns for that people sell as backdrops for graphic design, for wallpaper prints, for prints on t-shirts, mugs, you name it. You can create the, those graphics within these tools, creating website content images for your website, and then of course using the images that you create for videos that you make too. And then lastly, you, ha you have editing. So all three of these phases can be done with AI, or if you have existing content, you can edit it with a tool like ChatGPT, condensing long form content to a short, shorter format, checking for grammar, spelling and punctuation, fixing closed captions is an example that I've been doing. YouTube automatically transcribes our videos, but the capitalization, the punctuation is all wrong. Oftentimes even words are incorrect and ChatGPT, because it's intelligent, it can tell what the correct word should have been and it automatically, it's incredible how quickly you can edit, and I'm gonna show you in a case study, edit captions to make them look proper. It's insane. You can quickly change the tone of a anything that's written. So if you have something that you've written but you wanna make it funnier, if you wanna make it more serious, more professional, 
apologetic, more respectful, whatever it is, you can quickly do that. And then translations. And we've been seeing a lot of proof that the translations from ChatGPT are even better than what Google Translate has been doing because it does it in a more humanistic, natural way. And that's not going to be true for all languages, but it's something to test out. And obviously any kind of content that you have written, you can just plug it in, throw it in, have it translated. There are limitations on the length of text, but it's great for doing it either one at a time or if it's short form all at once. One idea going back to the keyword generation is you can actually go back to your old articles on a website or any sort of landing page, web content, your YouTube video description, your YouTube titles, you can edit them to make them more keyword friendly. And you would just write a prompt that asks to either, if you have a list of keywords to use these keywords throughout the content or simply to make this title more SEO friendly, to make this article more keyword SEO friendly. And that's one idea you can do with editing. Something that you would have to previously pay someone lots of money to go through all of your website content, you can do yourself within a matter of hours or days or have outsource it to someone who can do it for you. So these are just several ideas for how you can use these AI tools in your existing workflow. If you have other ideas, let us know in the comments of the class. We'd love to see what you are using these tools for too. Have a great day and we'll see you in another video. As you start using these tools, it's very important to have a conversation about the ethics of AI and how you can use them properly. First, let's talk about the limitations of AI. All of these tools are getting better and better, and who knows what the world will look like in a year, two years, let alone five, 10 years. And I think it's great that you're in this class. We're learning these tools because it's going to help us stay ahead of the curve and know how to use these tools properly. Right now, these tools, especially like ChatGPT or Google Bard, they have some inaccuracies in the responses. They sometimes present false data, false information. It can appear like it's coming back as a fact when in fact it's not. And these are things that you have to be aware of. Now, I do think that this sort of is an overstated fact about it. This is obviously a true thing that not all of the data is coming back correct. But in fact, I've found that a lot of it is very, very, very accurate. That doesn't mean you don't need to edit your work or what the work from ChatGPT. It doesn't mean you should just copy and paste without looking at it and doing fact checking. But it's just one of those things that you're going to hear continually from people because it catches the head. It's a good headline that it's making mistakes. And of course it will, but it's just something to be aware of when you're creating content. And then there's other limitations as well. The uniqueness of the responses. Yeah, it's going to get better and better. The more creative your prompt is, the more input data you provide for it. It can change the way that it responds. But imagine a world where five years ago, everyone was writing those like top 10 listicle articles, Buzzfeed style articles. And still people write those today and they're not great content, partially because they all end up sort of sounding the same. And that's where AI kind of is right now. If a hundred people prompt it with the same idea to write an article on the top 10 places to visit in Paris, those hundred articles are going to be very, very similar. And so as a creator, especially a creative person, or business, you need to find a way to use it as a tool that assists, but doesn't do all the work for you so that you still have a personality. Because I find that a lot of times, even if you put in the style prompts and the tone prompts, it lacks somewhat of a personality. You ultimately have that connection to your audience and AI is not going to completely replace you right now anyways where these tools stand. So I definitely think as a creative, as a content creator, if that's what you do, because there's so much content being put out there and every topic's been covered a million different ways and there's really no lack of content, 
it's more important than ever to have a direct connection with your audience, which you uniquely can provide. Besides the limitations, the ethics are a more important conversation. So there's four points that I want to just briefly cover and you should talk about them with your team if you're using these tools as a team or if you're using them yourself, come up with a way to be ethical in your approach of using these tools. So there's transparency, data privacy, copyright, and then bias and discrimination. If you're using these tools as part of a business service where you are writing content, where you are editing content, or anything else where you're using these tools to assist you, and the end result content is something that you yourself are not creating yourself, it's super important to be transparent about that when you are pitching your services. And maybe this is just a moral compass, a line in the sand that I believe in, but I don't think it's ethical for people to be pitching themselves as copywriters or editors or book writers and then just using these tools to do it for you. Second, we have data privacy. This is an issue that is a big one. And basically the issue is that tools like Google, ChatGPT, all of these, they're using information that has been scraped from the internet. And because it's AI, it's not like someone's choosing which article to use, which data, which book, which content to consume, which then makes up the AI mind that it can spit out in a response. And it might in fact receive some private data that should not be there. So it's that's why it's important to read whatever your responses are and you're putting out into the world because if it is actually violating someone's privacy that could be a huge huge deal. Similarly you have copyright. It's scraping all this information from the internet and there's going to be copyrighted information that it's using to formulate its responses. So you have to be careful about so again you just have to be careful about what you put out and try to have a step in your process to verify if what you are using has any sort of copyright issues. And lastly, bias and discrimination. Similarly, because it's using information that humans wrote, there might be bias and discrimination in that. For example, there might be articles or books that have inherent biases. And of course, that's sort of a blurred line as well. But for some people, there might be biases in some information on the internet. I think we can all <laughs> accept that. And so these tools, if they're using that as part of a response, can be a problem too. I think most of you watching are likely good people who have good intentions of using these tools to assist you. You're not maniacally trying to figure out how you can take advantage of the system using these tools no matter what, even if it's hurtful to somebody. So that's why I, I trust that you're going to be doing it in the right way, but I do think it's important to think about all of these ethics and limitations as you start using these tools in your job or business. Now that we know how to use the tools, I want to show you a real world example of how I am using them to help me with my content production. So I'm going to show you how I use this to create a YouTube video, everything from researching topics, outlining the video, scripting the video, and not just using what spit out, but being able to properly prompt, edit those responses to get exactly what I'm looking for, create the graphics for the YouTube thumbnail, writing out the information for the titles, description, tags, and fixing captions at the end of it. So let's jump in. This is gonna be a little bit of a longer video, but hopefully it'll give you some great ideas of how you can implement these tools in your workflow. So I've been putting out YouTube videos for quite a long time on my personal channel, and recently a couple buddies of mine, we started a new channel, Photography and Friends, which is the brand we have for our photography community. We run a lot of live streams on here, but we don't put out a lot of content outside of the live streams. And I think it would be great to be able to put out some more 
great trendy types of videos, specifically shorts, which is the format that a lot of people are using now to grow their channels. So I'm going to walk you through the entire process of what I'm doing. I'm doing this from the beginning. I haven't prepared this because I didn't want it to sound like it was too over prepared. I want you to actually see the exact process that I go through as a creative to do this kind of work. So the first thing I would do if I was starting from scratch or even where I'm at is do research. I already know some ideas for what I could create a short video on, but I think it's worthwhile to do a little bit of research too. So for this, I'm going to use both ChatGPT and Google Bard, and you'll see the difference. The first thing I might ask is, who are the top 10 YouTubers in the photography space? Because ChatGPT at this moment is not connected to the internet, it's going to choose photographers up until September 2021 that were popular, which generally will still be popular, but it's getting connected to the internet right now as I speak, they're doing um, beta trials of that. And so that's why I'm gonna use Google Bard as well. I'm gonna do the same exact prompt and we're going to see what the YouTubers are. So here we have some though, Peter McKinnon, Jared Pullen, Tony Northrup, Thomas Heaton, Mango Street. This is all great and as a creator, YouTuber in this space, I know that this is true. Although I also know that some of these YouTubers have kind of like dropped down in terms of popularity. Others have sort of popped up. And so here, let's go to Google Bard. We have very similar F stoppers, the art of photography, Thomas Heaton, Mango Street. So very similar, but some different ones. What I can do to take this research a little bit deeper is how many videos have each of these YouTubers published in 2023? Let's see if it knows how to respond to that because I want to know which ones are more popular right now. And here we have a list of videos. So F Stoppers has a lot, The Art of Photography. They all have generally a lot, uh, about the same amount. It's kind of funny that it's on a round number. I'm not completely sure if that's going to be accurate, so I would have to verify it. But it's a good starting point. And Google Bar, Google Bard, ChatGPT wouldn't be able to do this with uh, the, the numbers as of now until it's connected to the internet. What are the most popular YouTube videos for these YouTubers? I'm gonna do the same thing with ChatGPT. F stoppers, how to take a stunning landscape, landscape photo, the ultimate guide to composition, a year in the life, how to edit your photos like a pro, how to shoot stunning street photography. Okay, cool. We could even do this. We could pick one of these. Say, let's pick, let's pick uh, Sean Tucker. Was he on this list as well? He's not on this one. Oh yeah, there he is. I think he was on this one as well. And here we have, so this is cool, they came up with a few different options, uh, three top videos. We could ask for like the top 10 videos from each YouTuber, that's cool. Okay, so here we have like, okay, so five photography tips you need to know, cinematic B-roll tutorial. I'm looking for something that's more related to photography, photographing the Northern Lights. I'm just looking for something that pops out. Five portrait photography mistakes every beginner makes. This is awesome, that's a really good topic. So what I could do is use this topic and ask the tool to come up with something similar. That's kind of on the edge of just copying. So I don't wanna just necessarily do that. Let me look at the Bard. I'm gonna ask what are Sean Tucker's most popular YouTube videos in 2023? I should have asked for a list of like five or 10, but 
how to shoot stunning street photography, the best street photography cameras, the best street photography lenses, street photography days. So a lot of street photography, best street photography cameras, street photography lenses. This is a topic that my students always ask us. And so using my personal experience, this is a topic that stands out to me. So I'm just gonna go ahead for the sake of time, use this topic, but this is kind of gives you some ideas for how I use this, these tools to do research. So what I'm gonna do is write a list, prompt write a list of the top five lenses for street photography. Let's see what it comes out with, with just that prompt. I don't think it's gonna come up with the best list. And because again, ChatGPT is not connected to the current internet, we're gonna get some potentially older lenses. Although I like what it's putting out already. It is putting out just the lens itself, not specific brands. So that's good because it might be outdated, but if I want specific brands, I could ask for it. Okay, so this is cool. This gives us some brands, some specific lenses. I could ask, what are the top three street photography lenses for each brand? Nikon, Canon, Sony, Fujifilm. Am I missing any of my favorite brands? These seem to be the most popular ones that my students have. And this is good because we're getting some initial information which makes me think well this is kind of a random list I think it would be more practical to have for each brand so this is cool this is cool I like this list I like this list we got this good list of general lenses here which is nice I'm gonna do the same prompt for chat GPT see what they come up with what are the top three street photography lenses for each brand and this is on the free version of chat GPT 3.5 I just want to show you what it can do so it has the Nikon 35 50 and 28 let's see what Bard was 35 50 28 oh yeah 28 and then Canon was 35 50 24 35 50 24 interesting so same different order but the same so this is good if I'm not a total expert I could probably rely on this I would probably go do a little bit of research myself just to confirm, but for the sake of time, I'm just gonna take this list here that looks like it's doing well. It's pretty good on both. I kinda wanna just use the list right here. So I'm going to ask Google Bard, write a video script, a 60 second video script about this topic. And I'm just going to include what are the best street photography lenses. Actually, that's probably going to screw it up because I want it to use this list. So I'm going to include that in the prompt. Use these lenses. So what I should have done was just simply put, write a 60 second video script about the, this. I found that the video scripts on Google Bard aren't as good. So what I'm going to do is Go over here and say, I'm just going to ask it, write a 60 second video script for a short form social media reel about this topic using this information you provided. So because it has that information, it should pop it up over here. Discover the perfect lenses for capturing the essence of street photography. Nikon, Canon, Sony, Fujifilm, the top brands with lenses that bring street photography to life. 
For Nikon enthusiasts, the Nikon AFS, Nikkor 35, blah, blah, blah. Hmm, okay. So it only is picking one lens. So I'm gonna rewrite this prompt, let's see. So we're not getting exactly what we want, that's okay, we're gonna reprompt. Write a 60 second video script listing the top lenses for street photography. Use this list. The brand Nikon, Canon, Sony, and Fujifilm. Use this list and include all three lenses for each brand. All right, let's see what that provides. What will you provide, ChatGPT gods? Let's explore the top lenses for street photography across popular brand camera brands. For Nikon enthusiasts, the Nikon 35 1.8 is a stellar choice. Canon users swear by the Canon 50. Okay, so that's good. It might be limited on the time length. So let's go ahead and rewrite this, but include the other two alternate top lenses for each brand. As a reminder, here is the list I want you to use. So it's similar, let's see if it does. Great, perfect, so it's including the Nikon, all three Nikons, great, awesome. Okay, so it's doing what I asked for. So as you can see, sometimes it takes a little bit of editing. So this paused out, so I'm going to click the continue generating button. It should just continue generating. We don't need to, you used to have to prompt it and tell it to continue, but this is looking pretty good. So it gives us ideas for shots. It gives us all kinds of things that are great. I'm going to take this a step further and show you a really cool tool, AI tool called Pictory. Pictory AI is an automatic video creator and it can take articles or scripts and automatically create a video for you. So I'm going to use this. So I'm gonna use this. All you have to do is sign in and you can test it out. You have to pay to be able to download your, your videos, but it's pretty self-explanatory. You log in, again, free to sign up just to test it out. We're gonna choose script to video because we're gonna supply a script. You can also supply just a link to an article, which is cool, but th for this, I'm going to do the script to video. Top three street photography lenses. Now, the important thing is that I just need the text of the transcript. I don't need all of the shot ideas, scene breakdowns, etc. And so what I'm going to do is ask Fuji, uh, Fujifilm, ask ChatGPT, rewrite this, but just include the transcript of the voice over. No quotations, no shot ideas, etc. And hopefully it will give me back just the text. Okay, so this is gonna be a lot cleaner script, which is nice. All right, so I just typed in voiceover time calculator because what you would wanna do is actually read through this, make sure it's 60 seconds or less because sometimes it comes back longer and I asked it to write more or include more information. So we might have to cut this down. So I'm just gonna, let's try the voicerom.com and it has estimates right here. It's just ba a basic uh, calculation. Okay, gonna paste, let's calculate. So it does say two minutes. So I'm gonna do a little bit of editing of this, but I'll do that in Pictory AI. So I'm gonna come over here, paste my text. Now something to note is that there's gonna be new scenes every time there's a period and a line break. And so 
what's going to happen is it's going to automatically add text to the video and that's cool because it's good for social media but we don't want the text lines to be too long so i'm gonna just speed through this really quick and actually edit this script all right so i condensed this quite a bit i also added some of my own personal knowledge of camera lenses and i swapped one out that i particular in particular like myself and as you can see it's much more condensed i did the time estimate and it said about a minute so we're gonna see how this goes so i'm gonna click proceed it's gonna take that information but first we have to pick a a template for this so it's basically just the text style and we can edit this later on but i kind of like this flashlight one for this video it kind of goes with my brand and this pictory tool you can include your own branding colors fonts logos that will be added as well then here we're going to pick our aspect ratio i'm going to choose 9 by 16 for social media reels or shorts and you can also change this later on automatically there's a button that allows you to do this what you're going to see is several of scenes where the text pops up and video of I'm assuming cameras that it's going to add it's getting videos from story blocks and so that's why you have to pay to upgrade um, to use the stock footage and use the tool to download it but it's pretty incredible we'll be able to swap out the video we'll even be able to create an AI based voiceover all right so here we can preview here are the top street photography lenses so we can preview each slide or scene and it does add music which we can change okay so as you can see some of the b-roll is good that's behind the scenes some of it's not that great and we'll be able to change it so what we're going to do is first we're going to edit the text over on the left you see all of the different things you can edit but just to quickly show you I'm gonna move the text down the size is actually pretty good it's not too big and so I'm going to click this button to apply a position to all scenes then what I'm going to do is go to visuals and for each scene I'm just gonna check it out and I'm just gonna search for street photography first because this isn't exactly what I wanted maybe like the street photographer is something that I would use and then I'm just going to click it and it swaps it in place you can easily drag and drop it move it around you can preview it okay so pretty cool and this is like super quick and easy this isn't going to be a oscar worthy cinematography masterpiece then i would just go through and try to find the right b-roll sometimes it's good sometimes it's not an icon so i'm gonna click maybe this one there we go and just go through it i'm not gonna waste your time to do that though i want to show you the audio features so we can choose different songs so we can choose a mood maybe we want something a little bit more raw and gritty let's apply that let's find something that might fit our mood a little bit better Let's look for pop rock songs under genre. All right, so we're just gonna use this one. Kick out the can. It's gonna apply it to the video, but there's another tab for voiceover. You can also upload. So for voiceover, what you can do is you can click to record, voice, record voiceover, or you can use one of their AI voice voices. Welcome to Pictory. It has been shown. Welcome to Pictory. It has been shown that video increases conversion. Welcome to Pictory. It has been shown that video increases. Welcome to Pictory. Welcome to Pic. So let's just apply Jackson, and it's going to apply it to all the videos. When you click Preview, it's going to take a beat to actually play it. For Nikon users, the Nikon 35 mm f 1.8G is a stellar choice yeah so you would want to go in and edit that that's why doing your own voiceover might make more sense but that's pretty crazy it's not terrible and these AI voices are getting better and better there's all these other options for adding 
text, you could add visuals like stickers or elements like stickers and GIFs and all that kind of stuff. Down below you have your branding and what I'm gonna do now is just go through, edit the scenes and finish it up. All right, so here's the final version that it came up with. It ended up being about a minute and 24 seconds. So I could go in there and delete some stuff, maybe make these videos individual ones on each brand. That might even work better for my, for content for keywords and everything but let me just show you the first few seconds here are the top street photography lenses for nikon users the nikon 35 millimeters f 1.8 g is a stellar choice with its wide aperture and excellent low light performance it brings the streets to life other options are the nikon 50 mil not bad right so again you want to be as personal and unique as possible changing up the script but for speeding up the process of creating a short form short for youtube or a reel for instagram TikTok, it did a pretty good job so now let's head over to mid journey actually discord to see what i did to create images and i'm not going to show you the whole process i already did this and i just want to talk through the prompts to show you how i got my end result. I started with a prompt for a street photographer in Bangkok, a photo hyper realistic. It didn't really come back with what I wanted. So I was more specific and I changed it up. I did an experiment, an illustration of a street photographer juggling four different cameras. I changed the aspect ratio, assuming this would be for if I put it on YouTube and this is okay. Interesting, but not exactly the style. It could be used for something, but not exactly. I then did a more specific prompt, a photo photo of a street photographer in Bangkok with a camera around his neck. He has two other camera lenses in each hand, hyper realistic 16 by nine. It didn't follow the prompt of two lenses in each hand, but it did a pretty good job at a photo realistic image. Even the cameras themselves look pretty dang good. I tried doing a different prompt for digital art. I'm trying to get this idea of like juggling ideas for cameras. This one was pretty cool. Digital art of a photographer juggling a bunch of modern cameras and lenses. I put modern in there because the other one came back with like these retro style cameras. Camera lenses are in the air. The background is an illustration of a cityscape. I'm trying to tie in that idea of street photography. Then I, I like that so I did some variations but I hit the jackpot with my next prompt, which was a photo of a photographer trying to decide which lens to buy. There are four lens options. He is looking confused at each lens, hyper-realistic. The four camera brands are Canon, Nikon, Fujifilm, and Sony. It didn't follow, follow the number, but it got the idea really well. And the quality of this photo or this image is incredible. And it totally gets that idea. It's a captivating image. It's interesting. I did a variation of it and I really like uh, this first and the fourth one because the person, a high person is looking at the camera. So that's pretty, pretty dang good. So overall, I think these images are great to use. I would throw them in Canva, add some text for the title of my video on top of it, use Photoshop, whatever, whatever tool you use but pretty dang good results from mid journey. Just another step saving me lots of time. I don't have this many lenses. I don't have this background. It's not me necessarily, but that's okay. Uh, it wasn't try I wasn't trying to make it look like me for this example, but still a pretty captivating image. Let's go over to YouTube and I'm going to show you how to fix captions. Suppose we upload that video to YouTube, we can edit captions with ChatGPT. So I'm on the back end of my YouTube studio. I'm gonna find one of these other sort of shorter videos and let's go to the caption. So what should my next Nikon lens be? That's a great one. So let's look at subtitles. And here are the automatic ones. Whenever you add a YouTube video and publish it, it transcribes it. But as you can see here, it's just a big block of text. There's no capitalization, no punctuation. It, it really doesn't make much sense. So let's head over to you to chat GPT. I'm going to give it a roll. You are now a closed caption editor. Fix this text. 
So I just plugged in this big block of text and look what it came back with. This is a good lens question from the community. It has periods, it has commas, proper punctuation, proper capitalization. It's literally doing work that would take me 10, 15 minutes to edit or someone else and doing it in the background within like, you know, 30 seconds. Now I can go back to my YouTube video. I can paste this text and click edit timings and it's automatically going to time it out for us. Now we can play this. This is a good lens question from the community. Um, okay, so Andre, Andre asks, so they have a D, Nikon D7500. They've got the 35. What's even crazier is it kind of takes out some of the repetitions and words that I repeat. And then you just click publish it. So I just wanted to show you another case study or use of ChatGPT. So this has been a long case study, but I hope it shows you from beginning to end how I've saved literally hours and hours of time using these AI tools that you've learned so far in this class. Let me know if you want to see any more real live demos, if you have questions about this, about my process, and I hope that this has helped you. Have a great day. Thank you so much for watching this course. I know it was a super quick one and that was my goal with this class to help you get started with these tools quickly. They're not that difficult to use once you understand the basic process. And I think it's best to just play around with it, get inspiration from what other people are doing. If you want to dive deeper into any of these tools from coming up with better prompts to use cases to real world case studies, for example, of how we're using tools like ChatGPT and MidJourney to make money ourselves, we have other courses on that. So click to our profile and you can find our other ChatGPT, MidJourney, and other AI tool courses. We'd be happy to have you in those classes. But right now, I just hope that you feel more comfortable and confident using AI than ever before. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you in another class.